day, we all like to pour a glass of wine, go on Zillow and dream. But to make that Zillow house a reality, you have to have a good credit score. A credit score is an unbiased algorithm that tells lenders whether or not you can pay a mortgage. But what if it isn't unbiased at all? I'll explain in a segment called, How Did We Get Here? For many, owning a home is part of the American dream, like getting married, having kids, or wearing an American flag bikini while you shoot an AR-15 out of your pickup truck. <laughs> but owning a home is more reachable for some than others. Recently, the Associated Press released a study that found that when it comes to mortgages, banks are 40% more likely to reject Latino applicants, 50% more likely to turn down Asian or Pacific Islanders, 70% more likely to deny Native Americans, and 80% more likely to reject Black applicants. And these numbers are after they adjusted for variables, like income or work history. So why are people of color being turned down for loans so much more than white people? Or to quote DJ Snake and Lil Jon's song about mortgages, turned down for what? <laughs> well, at least part of the reason for that rejection is because of something that was left out of the study, credit scores. A credit score is a number that's supposed to tell a lender how likely you are to pay your bills on time. It's one of the most crucial numbers in your life right after that number you got at the bar last night, you dirty little dog. <laughs> And that number has some issues. The National Consumer Law Center said credit reports and scores reflect stunning racial disparities. So did the National Fair Housing Alliance and the Federal Reserve and the Brookings Institution and Harvard. The only other thing this many people agree on is that Nutella is delicious. Great job, Nutella, no notes. <laughs> Basically, in America, you can get credit for being white. Now, I know what you're thinking. How can credit scores be racist if they just reflect your financial history? Well, it's not that simple. Take Rent, for example. Not the musical, but that's only because I would need way more time to talk about the musical. Uh -uh. Mark and Roger thought they were gonna get a free apartment forever, and they're gonna walk all over their black landlord to do it? I don't think so. <laughs> According to the experts, People who pay their rent on time are likely to pay their mortgage on time. In fact, a person with a low credit score who pays their rent is more likely to pay their mortgage on time than someone with a high credit score who doesn't. But here's the thing. Common versions of the credit score don't use rent payments in their scores, which is insane. It's like predicting who is going to win the bachelorette and not taking into account the first impression rose. <laughs> are you kidding me? That's the most important way to predict. But Leaving rent payments out of the formula isn't just stupid, it's racist. Because while rent payments don't count toward your credit score, mortgage payments do. And guess who's more likely to have mortgages? White people. To be polite, I'll just call them Macklemore fans. <laughs> yes, a 2020 study found that 44% of black families own their home compared to 73.7% .7 of Macklemore fans. So let's review. You need a mortgage to get credit, but you can't get a mortgage unless you have credit. Basically, black people can't buy a house until they own a house. A sentence so cryptic, it should be said by a troll under a bridge. And it's not just rent. Credit scores take into account all kinds of questionable stuff. Some credit agencies actually consider SAT scores, a measurement that's so biased against black people, we already did a whole segment about it. They could also factor in information about whether you graduated from college or how often you change addresses or whether you enjoy drinking margaritas and watching old episodes of Living Single. Okay, I made that last one up, or did I? Because here's the thing, no one knows exactly how credit scores are determined. The formulas are considered trade secrets. You know, kind of like your mom's chili recipe, the secret is cumin and love, but mostly cumin. <laughs> and your credit score doesn't just affect your ability to buy a house. Employers use credit reports to decide whether to give you a job. Car dealers use them to pick the interest rate on your vehicle. Credit scores even determine how much interest you pay on your student loans, which explains why a study found that borrowers who attend mostly white colleges get lower interest rates than borrowers who attend historically black colleges. Though, frankly, it's worth paying more to see a halfway decent halftime show. So in the end, people of color get lower credit scores because the system is biased. 
Because of those scores, they have to pay higher down payments and interest rates, and that makes them more likely to default on their loans, which in turn will lower their credit score even more. Even the writer of Squid Game is like, stop, this story about money is too depressing. So <laughs> how do we fix it? Honestly, by getting rid of credit scores. They're biased and they're being used to oppress people. And fun fact, a lot of countries don't have them at all. They're extremely American, like easy cheese and guns. <laughs> but if they'll both kill you, they'll both kill you. <laughs> but if we're going to stick with credit scores, we at least need some transparency. If one number is going to determine our entire future, we have a right to know how they got it. That way, a new generation of black people won't have to get rejected for mortgages and think to themselves, uh, what are the words I'm looking for? Turn down for what? Congress is struggling right now to pass a much needed infrastructure bill, but Republicans are claiming that America doesn't have trillions of dollars to spend on frivolous stuff like infrastructure, childcare, and student loan forgiveness. But you know America be lying. <laughs> America is that friend who's balling in the VIP section of the club, but when you ask her about the $50 she owes you, America gets all loud and asks you why you're bothering her about an old funky little $50. But instead of bottle service, America is buying dick-shaped spaceships that don't even go to space. And instead of $50, you're wondering when you can get some student debt relief. Well, I'm gonna sit here tonight and figure all of these problems out because who knows more about struggling to pay bills and being in debt than someone who spent 15 years doing improv? <laughs> Zip, zap, broke. <laughs> yes, and I'm overdrawn. Can I get a suggestion? Oh, I can't afford one? Great. Now, last month, the Treasury Department released a study saying the tax gap, the difference between the taxes owed and the amount collected, is about $600 billion a year, or one pair of Yeezys. Now, that's a lot of money owed to the U.S. government, and the IRS is very serious about finding the people who owe it. But they're not looking where you think they are. According to a report by ProPublica, the IRS spends a disproportionate amount of their time and resources chasing down the people who make the least money. That's right. They go to the poorest counties and look at people who claim the earned income tax credit. That's a tax credit that was created to refund tax money to the working poor. In fact, if you claim the earned income tax credit, you're more likely to face IRS scrutiny than someone making 20 times as much, which is crazy. That's like Batman deciding to let the Joker go so he can focus on some guy fishing without a license. <laughs> so the IRS uses a disproportionate amount of resources to collect the smallest number of tax dollars from the poorest people. But they aren't just looking for poor people, like a cop at a speed trap, they're also on the lookout for people of color, like a cop at a speed trap. <laughs> According to a recent investigation by The Root, people who live in disproportionately non-white counties are audited at higher rates. In fact, the IRS seems to specifically audit places where rich people aren't, like rural Mississippi or any coffee shop that doesn't have oat milk. Now, here's a map of where America audits at high rates, okay? And here's the distribution of non-white people in America. These two maps could look more similar if they were named Mary, Kate, and Ashley. <laughs> so is poor people cheating on their taxes the reason the US government is broke? No, but also if you think about it, no. First of all, the IRS themselves have said that when they catch people who misused the earned income tax credit, those people usually cheated by mistake because the law is so complicated, which is ridiculous. Paying taxes shouldn't be more confusing than building an Ikea dresser, because in this case, when you end up with three screws left over, you could go to jail. <laughs> Second of all, the majority of the money owed to the IRS is owed by rich people who simply refuse to pay their taxes. Now, I'm not talking about tax breaks and loopholes. I'm talking about the tax equivalent of sitting down at a restaurant, ordering a steak, and when the bill comes, saying, pass. On top of that, the top 10% of income earners who cheat on their taxes or refuse to pay will cost the U.S. about $5 trillion over the next 10 years. That's a trillion with an R. That's right. I prefer to go by the second letter. The rich owe the IRS over 20 times more than poor people do, but the Treasury Department says it's easier to audit poor people. They are literally overlooking bank robbers to catch a customer who accidentally took the teller's pen. So let's go back to where we started. I said I was gonna find us enough money to pay for infrastructure, childcare, and student debt. Well, 
The price tag for the original infrastructure bill was estimated at $3.5 trillion over 10 years. And the Brookings Institute said forgiving $50,000 in student debt for every borrower in the whole country would cost $1 trillion. And the American Families Plan that offers child care for working families would cost an estimated $225 billion. Now, if you add that up, carry the one, a bag of gaga goo goo, that's about $4.7 trillion, which means if we collect unpaid taxes from the wealthiest 10%, we can do everything on that list and have about $300 billion left over for margaritas. We did it, guys! Woo! We did it! We figured out how to solve all of America's problems. I swear, I must be some kind of genius. Either that or the IRS, Congress, and the Treasury Department are overlooking wealthy white people and systematically burdening poor and non-white people with an unequal share of America's fiscal and financial responsibilities. No, America couldn't possibly be that racist. I'm probably just a genius, but at least we know how we got here. Tonight, we're gonna talk about prison conditions, and that can be tough because a lot of people assume that prisons are filled with bad people, so we don't need to worry about them. So let me get this out of the way up top. Yes, prisons may be filled with people who have made at least one bad decision, but so are Nickelback concerts and divorce court. And yet we still treat those people like human beings. So we need to do the same for prisoners. Now, a few months ago, the U.S. Department of Justice filed a civil rights lawsuit against the state of Alabama. Now, this is interesting for two reasons. First, because I didn't know you could sue a whole state. Friggin' watch your back, Florida. And <laughs> Second, because the lawsuit says Alabama's poor management is leading to homicides, rapes, and serious injuries in its prisons. Alabama has the most violent prison system in America, and having the most violent anything in America is a very big deal. It's like having the flakiest croissant in France or being the most unhinged person in a Facebook thread. <laughs> now, I know I said that I'd explain all this to you, but honestly, I am not sure that I can. Now, the good news is I don't have to. Instead, we have quotes from inmates inside the Alabama Department of Corrections. You'll hear some tonight, and they are 100% real. So let's start with the living conditions. Saying that Alabama prisons are overcrowded is like saying that Shonda Rhimes shows are slightly horny. Sure, it's true, but it's also a huge understatement. The Bibb County Correctional Facility in Brent, Alabama was built to hold 918 inmates. It currently houses over 1,700. The Elmore Correctional Facility was built for 600 people and now has 960 inmates. They, there are clowns in tiny cars who hear those numbers and say, that's too crowded. <laughs> now, with the overcrowding and unsanitary conditions in those prisons, it is not surprising that COVID is raging. Elmore, the facility with 960 inmates, had 191 people test positive in one day, which is horrifying. Usually the only time you see that much alarming positivity is when you're watching The Sound of Music. <laughs> really, Maria? Brown paper packages? That's your favorite? Raise your standards, girl! Maria, I need you to listen to me. If you marry him, you are going to be doing the same job you're doing right now, but for free. Don't fall for it! worse, once the prisoners get sick, they are often ignored. Across the U.S., prisons haven't done enough to quarantine sick inmates, putting everyone around them in grave danger of getting sick or even dying. According to the Bureau of Justice, statistics, being incarcerated in Alabama is three times deadlier than cancer. And deadlier than cancer is one of those phrases you should never have to hear, like bloodier than Squid Game or dumber than a Kushner. <laughs> Unfortunately, it gets worse because one of the deadliest hazards in the Alabama prison system is the guards themselves. An inmate named James said, I've been stabbed four times. I've been beaten so many times I can't even count. None of those stabbings came from an inmate. Not one of those beatings came from an inmate. Now, if you're thinking maybe that prisoner is lying, that's fair, let's hear from another one. Larry said, the guards are handcuffing these inmates and beating them and killing them. And BJ, who was incarcerated, said of, said of his experience, the physical abuse is rampant. Rape is everywhere. It is like living in a zoo. But hey, maybe you don't believe any prisoners. Then listen to the DOJ report that talks about an officer who, 
took a handcuffed and compliant inmate out of an observation room, threw him onto the ground, and then punched, kicked, and beat him with a baton. And when it was finished, his supervisor, who had watched the whole thing, said, that's fair. I want to look at you right now and say, this isn't who we are, America, but... Until we learn to treat human beings with dignity and stop letting this happen in our names, it's exactly who we are. Remember when BJ said living in prison was like living in a zoo? Well, here's the difference. If this had happened in a zoo, people would be rioting in the streets to make sure it never happens again. Don't let a white person hear about a sad giraffe. They will lose their minds. <laughs> now, I know some of you might be saying, this sounds terrible, but what does it have to do with me? Well, first of all, the Alabama prison system is the worst example, but prisons all over the country have similar issues. But also, now that they're using federal money to build those prisons, you are an investor, and that means you get a say. So how can you make a difference? Well, the good news is there are already people working on these issues. You can donate your time or money to places like the Equal Justice Initiative. And if you specifically want to help Alabama inmates, donate to the Alabama Appleseed Center for Law and Justice. But most importantly, we can't just look away because these are our cousins and our uncles and our fathers and our sons. They are us. Hell, it could be me. I have a best-selling book, two TV jobs, and my own show, but every day I leave the house knowing that if I cross paths with the wrong police officer when they're having a bad day and looking for someone to take it out on, I could be in jail tomorrow. Y'all all be talking about she shouldn't have been talking to the officer like that, please. America's prison problem is not some distant problem. It's our problem. And I know I said I'd explain all this, but in this one case, I do not know exactly how we got here. I just know that it's time to get out. Advances in technology have improved our lives in both big and small ways. From phones we unlock with our faces to devices counting our steps to filters that turn us into talking cats. Oh, I've always wanted to try this. What's the matter, Batman? Don't like a kitty with claws? <laughs> Technology is supposed to make our lives more convenient and more equitable because unlike people, computers and algorithms can't be racist. But what if they totally are? Let me explain in a segment called, How Did We Get Here? Now, technology exists to make our lives better, but sometimes things that are there to make life easier actually make some people's lives a lot harder. The problems can show up in tiny, annoying ways, like this story about automatic soap dispensers that don't recognize black hands. That's right. Think of automatic soap dispensers like the TV show Friends. They're clean, they're everywhere, and they're totally unaware that black people exist. <laughs> but here's the thing. When it comes to technology and black people, it's not just our hands that are getting done dirty. First, let's talk about something called artificial intelligence, or AI. That's basically when computers are programmed to do things that usually take human brains. It's how you get personalized shopping recommendations on Instagram, or why Google Maps can tell you how to avoid traffic, or why anyone who named their daughter Alexa is going to be apologizing for the rest of their life. <laughs> Alexa, I'm sorry. Alexa, shut up. Not you, Alexa. No, no, Alexa, I'm gonna kill you. Not you, Alexa. You, Alexa, die. Live, Alexa. <laughs> now, we like to think that computers are neutral, but the fact is, AI is programmed by people, and people are biased. Bias is part of the human condition, like love or death, or having to whisper ready tidy, lefty loosey every time you open a jar. But that bias has real world consequences. Take Google. You know, the place where you search your ex-boyfriend's name six times a day, even though you know you can do better because that idiot only owns one towel. <laughs> In 2015, a black software developer named Jackie Alcine realized that when Google Photos used AI to categorize his pictures, they sorted images of him and his black friend into a folder titled Gorillas which is insanely racist. In fact, it's so racist, I give it six months before that algorithm gets its own Fox News show. <laughs> and Google's racist AI isn't just a one-time thing. In one experiment, it labeled a thermometer held by a white hand as an electronic device and the same object held by a dark-skinned hand as a gun, which is unacceptable because in this country, the only people allowed to confuse random objects for guns are the police officers. But 
algorithms that label pictures are just the tip of an extremely racist iceberg. There's also an arbitrary face scanning algorithm that claims it can use AI to find out who is best for a job by scanning their face. There's an algorithm that claims to predict which criminals will reoffend that has been known to falsely flag black defendants as future criminals at almost twice the rate as white defendants. Now, there's a medical algorithm that favors white patients over sick or black ones, which is unforgivable in a system that already treats black people like an afterthought. Unfortunately, in America, getting appropriate health care is a lot like playing chess. When you're white, you always get to go first. That's why my strategy in either one is to just yell, king me, and see if I get anything extra. <laughs> but as bad as all those other examples are, perhaps the most alarming use of AI involves facial recognition technology. Recently, a black computer scientist named Joy Blumwini found out that she couldn't get the robots she worked with to detect her face. She couldn't figure out why until Halloween when she wore a white mask. That's when the robots immediately recognized her as a person. <laughs> Let me repeat that. A black woman literally wasn't recognized as a human being unless she wore a white mask, a metaphor so on the nose it's basically a nostril. <laughs> it's less a metaphor and more a solid ending for a Jordan Peele movie. <laughs> and by the way, the only person who should have to wear a white mask to get attention is this guy. We get it, Phantom. You love, your love language is chandeliers and attempted murder. <laughs> but Joy's isn't the worst facial recognition story because if there's anything scarier than having algorithms ignore you, it's having them do exactly the opposite. Just last year, a man named Robert Williams was arrested for stealing five watches because facial race facial recognition technology decided his ID matched a photo of the thief. There's just one teensy thing though, it was not him in the photo. In fact, he had an alibi and even the detectives admitted the picture wasn't him, but that didn't stop him from having to pay bond, find an attorney and go to court. And the thing is, Mr. Williams isn't alone. According to a federal study on facial recognition, Asian and African American people were up to 100 times more likely to be misidentified than white people, which is insane. At this point, you can't even call it facial recognition anymore. It's just a ridiculously expensive machine that tells you if someone has a face. So the real question here is, what's causing these racist algorithms and how do we fix it? Well, let me say it again. Computers are programmed by people and people are biased, not just white people, everyone. I know I am. For example, I think that any couple that rides a tandem bicycle is definitely plotting each other's murder. <laughs> That's a bias I have and I'm not afraid to admit it. But in the case of an AI, in, but in the case of AI, everyday biases have life-changing consequences. Basically, the bullshit we put into our computers is the bullshit that comes out. Like they used to say in church, garbage in, garbage out. Can the church say amen? Amen. Ha ha, you're a church. So <laughs> that means we need diverse faces training the AI and diverse brains building it. And if women and people of color aren't included in the AI process, the technology will continue to exclude us or even worse, target us. And we can't let that happen because Unless you're a ghost haunting an opera house, this should never have to be part of your work uniform. Over the years, ads have sold us a lot of really bad products, like this actual real life ad saying that people who are tired at work should consider cocaine. <laughs> cocaine, nature's way of saying earn more money. <laughs> of course, we all know that that's not true. A more realistic slogan would be cocaine. Nature's way of saying, I work at a hedge fund and I'm about to tell you my idea for a screenplay. <laughs> or maybe just cocaine. Ah! <laughs> but whether we like it or not, ads can make a real difference. So tonight, we're gonna talk about what might be the most effective and long-running ad campaign of all time. These ads aren't running between the TV shows, they are the TV shows. And the product they're selling is the American police officer. For most Americans, almost everything we know about the police comes from the media. After all, most Americans have never been arrested and in a given year, the vast majority don't have contact with police at all. In 2016, for example, only 24% of residents experienced contact with police. Cops are just one of those things you see a lot more of on TV than in real life, like simultaneous orgasms or Sheldons. Now, <laughs> I don't know a single Sheldon, but they're on TV everywhere. Now, 
for the past 60 years, there has been an organized plan to build up the reputation of the police and do it using the thing Americans love most, sitting in front of the TV. It's called copaganda. <laughs> and to understand where it comes from, let's go all the way back to the 1950s to a show called Dragnet. I just want to say that Dragnet would be an amazing name for a TV show about four hackers who are also drag queens. Their names would be Lotta Ram, Megahertz, D-Bug, and of course their leader, Antivirus. Call me NBC. Anyway, the actual Dragnet show was a show about the police. And in order to make it more realistic, the creator made a deal with the LAPD to get inside information. But the police got something much better in return because they made a deal that all scripts had to be formally approved by the LAPD's public information division before filming began. In other words, the police got to decide how the police were portrayed on TV, which is insanely biased. It's like having rich people with attachment issues give notes on succession. <laughs> the results of this deal with the LAPD meant that during an era when 50 Los Angeles police officers brutally beat seven young men in their custody on Christmas, Dragnet instead showed a group of upstanding cops doing their darndest to solve crimes. Copaganda! And Americans bought it. In fact, it worked so well that the media has done it over and over since. Dragnet became the template for every cop show you have ever seen, from Law & Order to NYPD Blue, from NCIS to Sister Cops. Okay, I made that last one up, but it's a great idea, and my sister Lacey and I would be happy to co-star. Call me, NBC. <laughs> Copaganda has single-handedly created the legend of the hero police officer. It's also perpetuated other myths that still harm us to this day, like that crime is rising constantly, or that policing is one of the most dangerous jobs, or that black people are criminals. So let's start with the first myth, that crime in America is rampant. According to Gallup polls, for the past 20 years, more than half of Americans believed crime is worse than the year before. Yet, here's what the actual crime rate has been doing. That's right, crime has been decreasing consistently. The only thing falling more steadily is President Biden. Oh, God. So, why do we... think crime is getting worse? Well, according to one study, people's perceptions of the crime rate actually rise and fall along with TV violence. In other words, people think crime is bad because it's bad on TV. It's the same reason that after watching The Great British Bake Off, I think I can make a chocolate souffle because the stupid <laughs> lying TV made it look true. Now, let's look at the second myth, that policing is one of America's most dangerous jobs. Now, I want to be careful on this one because being a police officer is a dangerous job. And aside from almost spraining an ankle during a song parody, my job isn't very risky. So I don't want to discount the work that they do. But according to data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, being a police officer is actually far less dangerous than other jobs, like being a garbage collector or being a delivery driver. That's right. Cops actually have fewer on-the-job fatalities than the guy who brings you those chicken tenders you ordered when you were drunk. And then when he arrives, reminds you that you ordered them. <laughs> and it's important to get a realistic idea of the dangers of policing, because one of the major reasons why we can't reform the way cops are trained is because people who watch police shows think cops get into a karate fight three times a week. And even worse, the propaganda may have convinced the police themselves that they are in constant danger, which could be why police officers killed more people running away from them over the past five years than the total number of cops shot and killed on duty. That might also be why, since 2015, police officers shot and killed three times more black people than cops were shot and killed by anybody. Being a police officer is a dangerous job, but what might even be more dangerous is being a black person who runs into one. And that brings us to our final propaganda myth, that black people are criminals. How does TV normalize disproportionately killing black people? by teaching the public that they deserve it. For example, in real life, black people are 35% of gang members, but in TV and film, we play 64% of all gang members. And when a character is listed as a thug, it's played by a black actor 66% of the time. Now think about that. 
If every time you see a criminal on TV is a black person, you're gonna start to think there's a correlation. In the same way that if every time I see a skincare commercial, J-Lo was in it, I'm gonna start thinking it's normal to look like this at 52. It's not. <laughs> She's superhuman, she shouldn't look like that. Basically, we've been fed an ad campaign that teaches us that police officers are heroes, putting themselves in grave danger to save us from a crime-ridden country full of black criminals, and that's bullshit. So if we wanna make it better, we are going to have to fight against the copaganda and start working with the truth. Take it from me, Heisman Trophy winner and current prime minister of Iceland, Amber Ruffin. This has been How Did We Get Here? <laughs>